Hey, it's Dr. Mike T. Nelson here. Welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast for how to gain more muscle and strength, better body composition with a flexible approach. Today on the podcast, I have my good buddy, Lee Boyce, and we get into a discussion of kind of everything around gym, I guess you could say culture, personal training, clients, some tips that uh, both of us have used over the years if you are a trainer and even if you're a client and you work with a trainer, I think you'll enjoy this uh, kind of wide-ranging discussion. Uh, I first met or first saw Lee's stuff on uh, T Nation in the past and enjoyed a lot of his videos and over the years been able to hang out with him several times. Uh, he is a personal trainer up in Toronto it's also teaching fitness professionals there in an academic sense. And every time we get to hang out, it's always been really fun just exchanging ideas with him over the years. So enjoy this conversation coming up. As always, it's brought to you by the Flex Diet Podcast, which is this show from the Flex Diet Certification of the same name. So if you want eight interventions to maximize nutrition and recovery with your clients or yourself, Go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com, and you'll be able to get on the wait list. Right now, it looks like we'll be opening up again around the first of the year, uh, January 2021. Uh, so go to flexdiet.com, get on the wait list. That'll put you on the newsletter. So as soon as it opens, in addition to cool daily content, uh, you will have all the information. So check out this podcast here with my good buddy, Lee Boyce. Hey, what's going on? It's Dr. Mike T. Nelson here with the Flex Diet Podcast. And I'm here with my buddy, Lee Boyce. How's it going, man? Going good. Going good. Just trying to uh, dodge the snowflakes as they're just coming down now for the first time for the year. So uh, it's an interesting, uh, interesting period. And I see you're hiding in your car, pulled off, hopefully safe in a parking lot, not with all the other crazy ass drivers, correct? Oh, oh yeah. You know, I'm just, I'm pulled over <laughs> here. It's not good. <laughs> <clears throat> uh yeah it's oddly enough that we had some snow in minnesota so far but it's like 18 degrees fahrenheit today but no snow yet so i'm sure it'll it'll snow once again and then i try to stay off the roads the first day of snowfall because people forget how to drive even though it snows like every winter in minnesota just like it does in toronto but people tend to forget all the time yeah, so um, that's exactly what I'm experiencing as we speak right now. <laughs> so uh, one reason why I'm definitely pulled over for sure. But um, yeah, you know, like I, I think that um, with the COVID stuff, plus the fluctuating temperatures and everything like that, there's going to be an interesting next couple of weeks with regards to weather changes and sickness and all kinds of stuff like that. So we'll see. Yeah. Are you guys still kind of shut down up there? I know Montreal was kind of shut down and different parts of Canada just seem to be highly variable. Yeah, we uh, we're one of the sort of like the hub transmission places. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we sh we just shut down again a week ago and mm. um, we're in like stage one lockdown right now, which is like the most severe one. So only essential businesses are open. And um, I think that it's going for a minimum of 28 days, which would take us to Christmas, which is oh, wow. clearly not going to happen. They're going to go past Christmas and bring it into the new year, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, because the second that they open on like the 21st of December, the only thing they're going to, the only thing that's going to happen is cases will spike right back up. So, right. yeah. <clears throat> and I assume that's going to affect your ability to be training clients, obviously, in the gym. I would assume gyms are considered not essential like most cities. Yeah. So um, all the gyms are shut down. All the gyms are closed. Luckily, I have a gym that I can train at myself, but uh, I can't work with clients until it's all open again. So even when things did reopen, which was on the 7th of November, they closed promptly again on the 21st. So people were oh, training geez. clients for two weeks. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I feel so bad for people like, you know, like yourself and other people who train people in person. Um, I'm lucky I converted my garage to a gym, so it's, it's been nice. And <clears throat> when everything happened, when we were originally in Costa Rica, we came back that I mean, everything had just been closed up. So I didn't have anything to worry about and just said, nope, not doing anything. No one's coming over. And yeah, but it's, yeah, it's pretty hard otherwise. 
Yeah. So, I mean, like it, it's definitely something where trainers have to be savvy enough to be able to pivot to a lot of online platforms and stuff like that if they want to still, uh, you know, earn and everything. So, um, you know, for people who don't have that, um, I guess, uh, expertise or that background or who haven't taken the opportunity to really, really make use of social media platforms or online coaching or virtual training. There's a lot of trainers who are doing Skype sessions and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Not my thing, but it's still one of several options that are available in alternative to, um, you know, working with clients in person based on the circumstances. And uh, it's worth everybody's uh, time and investment of, of uh, energy to try to get decent at this sort of thing, because it's going to matter. And I don't think we're going to be out of the woods up here anyway, yeah. in the next couple of months, like, once this is over, there's still going to be some <laughs> aftermath sort of thing that's gonna it's gonna last for a little while. So we should, we should be on top of this. Yeah, I mean, obviously, John Goodman has said this a fair amount. And I, I saw an online nutrition certification, so people are like, oh, you're just biased. But I'm like, I still think almost every trainer, I was even saying this a couple of years ago, should have some online portion, right? So even if you're someone who works with the clients like three days a week, they come to the gym, they do everything, just do some basic nutrition stuff online. Like, right? because yep. they're probably going to go on vacation. They're probably going to go write them a simple body weight thing, like have part of even programming if they want to only work with you two days a week they want to do one day on their own right and charge extra for that <clears throat> programming aspect so one you build up the skill set two you're helping them get a little bit better result you make a little bit more revenue and then now if you have to transition even like harder because the gym is closed you can be like okay well you know write you a body weight workout or you got two dumbbells at home or a dusty kettlebell or whatever and i think it just gives them you know, more options. And it also yeah. helps the clients stay engaged too, because I mean, we all know that a lot of clients, especially people who work with someone in person tend to be kind of an all or nothing. Like they're there, they're committed, they're doing the stuff. And then when they're not with you, it's like, who knows what, <laughs> what the hell's going on? <laughs> well, the thing is, is that like, as trainers, especially, we have to be, um, we have to make sure that we maintain the mindset of giving the clients kind of like resources and the, the, the power to be able to not need us yes. as directly as time goes on. Right. We want to give them the chance to learn and graduate to a certain level of their own knowledge. And so uh, part of that does come through a lot of programming and whatnot. It always hurts me when I think about a lot of clients that I have or that I have had where the only times they're working out are the times that they're seeing me and that's yes. it, right? And, um, you know, that's inevitable. There's always going to be people who are like that. But the goal should be if they said to me, hey, you know, I want to start doing things on my own. I want to um, have a little bit better understanding of these concepts. Can you make something for me? Absolutely. I would hoped that you've said that for all this time. Yeah. So – that's uh, that's that should be the real goal and the intention for a lot of trainers. Um, and if you have a client who's been around for 10 years, which I've got clients who've been around for that long, um, it's got to be a matter of choice for them at that point, rather than I don't know what I'm doing if I'm not with right. you right now. Right. You <laughs> should have taught them something in that time period. So, um, you know, that's the way that I see it. That's the way I try to approach it myself. And um, that's what I like to promote because it's it's very important. Yeah, and I think even just I don't do any in person training anymore than just, you know, one off weird type sessions. But you know, when I did work in a gym for a while, like the clients that looking back I just didn't like working with that much were the people who had to be told absolutely everything that they needed to do and just they just weren't at that position to take that next level of ownership. And you could tell yeah. even by just the questions they would ask and you would ask them, you know, Oh, what'd you do yesterday? and just even small things were just kind of not not in their mind space where you had other people where they're like, okay, so I'm going to be with you two days a week. Uh, I can train on Friday. You know, what should I do on Friday? You're like, oh, it's so awesome that you actually asked because you can tell they're taking more ownership of the process. And eventually when they transition to going out in the real world on their own, they're going to be in a much, much better position. Yeah, 100%. Um, I was thinking of a person uh, – particular clients and especially during a particular time like when I was a lot younger um, let's say in the first couple of years that I was a trainer uh, so I'm thinking age 20 21 I would get upset if a training client came to me and said hey yeah you know I went on vacation for example for two weeks and uh, while I was on vacation I picked up sessions with this other trainer out there and I did these sessions and I got through it you know I would be like oh you you, you trained with another trainer like what oh, is you're this you're cheating on me bro <laughs> right whereas now whereas now I look at it and I try to encourage that sort of thing yeah. you know given that the person keeps you safe and everything like that 
it's promoting your consistency. It's keeping you on top of things. It's showing that you have the drive to actually do it on your own as well and uh, and seek out some kind of assistance. Um, it's even better than just training yourself on, on and following your own programming and doing it yourself. You have somebody to push you. You have somebody to monitor your form and technique. So honestly, it is something that, you know, we're trying to help people. We're trying to help people get better and we're trying to establish habits for people as well. That's the biggest part of this. And so if we're successful at that, then they will take on uh, an approach like that where they do want to sort of seek out help if they're in a different city, if they're in a different place, if they're on vacation right now, if, they, uh, if, they're, if they're on their own, are they going to look for you to help them with programming and so on so they can do things themselves? Um, that independent sort of side of things, it's, it's something that uh, is underrated that we should sort of bring up in our priority list as trainers to sort of try to promote. Yeah, and that's also a very, I'd say, secure and mature mindset too. Right, because you're not worried that they, oh my gosh, they worked out with another trainer for two weeks. Oh, they're gonna leave me and never come back again. You're like, yeah. no, that that's great. You're gonna be gone for two weeks. You got in what you needed to do. Great, you come back. Cool, we're back doing you know what it is we were doing before. So, exactly. You know, it's a revolving door with training. Like, uh, and again, I've only after what 14, 15 years almost doing this is when I can really start seeing this happen. Where, you know, you have a client and maybe they fall off and they go away. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, they swing back around and they say, hey, you know, um, I don't know if you remember me, but I was wondering if we can do some <laughs> sessions again type of thing. And, you know, that has happened to me literally countless times over the course of my career where you think you've lost a client or a client is done or whatever, or they go and train with someone else. And then things change and then they're back with you. I have so many people or I've had so many people over the course of time where, you know, they're here and then they're gone or they train with you for three years and then a year, two years go by and then they come back, mm -hmm. you know, and it's it's just it gives you a sense of calm a little bit because if you do lose a client well guess what more clients are going to come anyway new people that you haven't met yet and then on top of it there's probably going to be some instance over the course of time where that relationship that you built with that client that you had over two years three years whatever it is it's not going to go for granted they have a trust for you they have a respect for your your knowledge and your expertise and they're going to come back around at some point to work with you you know, and, um, you know, that's just it's that's how it is kind of in most metropolis, especially. And um, a lot of tra a lot of training clients are pretty loyal when where that's concerned, especially if they have, um, you know, a decent head on their shoulders and you never hurt them or anything like that. Um, it's 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 heartwarming to think of it that way, because uh, it gives you a little bit more security in, in, in your your work and your job, especially if you're a private trainer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember even, man, probably about five years ago now I had. Two clients in particular, I was just doing online only, and they would just disappear for months at a time. <laughs> like, and at that time, I wasn't very good with tracking, you know, compliance and stuff. It was like, hey, fill out the spreadsheet instead of, you know, online apps and stuff like that, where you just kind of click a button. Um, and for a while, I had this deep agony of like, in the past, I would just fire them. I'm just like, oh, you're not doing the work. I don't want to just take your money. And I think it was uh, something John Brardy said was that. Well, maybe you're the only person in their life that is providing them any sorts of direction or any better information because I'd still send them their updates. I'd still send them everything. I just didn't hear anything back. So right. for all I knew, they could have been doing the workouts. They could have been doing all the training. We're just too busy to update me or whatever. And one of the clients in particular would like <clears throat> resurface like every three months. And it turns out they were doing everything. They just their whole life got busy, but they were still doing the work. And so I think sometimes we it's easy to forget that when we start losing some interaction. And obviously you want interaction. You want to know what's going on. You want to be more updated. But, you know, sometimes as a trainer, you may be the only sort of positive or better information, you know, in their life at that particular time, too. So we never know how the results are going to go or kind of what effect you have on people either. You know, it's funny you say that because um, uh, NSCA, uh, they do the personal training quarterly magazine. Yes, and, uh, BTQ. I contribute to it from time to time. And uh, I was actually asked to sort of put one in uh, a possible subject pitch in there for this coming up. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, issue. And so he left it to me. The editor left it to me to sort of like come up with a good subject mm. and literally like 30 minutes ago is when I when I submitted this pitch and I said, you know, what about a subject that has to do with uh, the roles of a personal trainer in terms of what kind of hats they're supposed to wear 
um, for, for different kinds of clients to make a successful career, to make a career that's really worthwhile. And um, included in that, in this pitch that I said, included in that would be things like um, being able to make sure that you're managing the client properly based on their personality type, based on what their habits are like um, with regards to, you know, are they somebody who's very social? Are they somebody who's not social? Are they somebody who's got a home-based job? Are they somebody who's out and about? Um, do they have a, are they young? Are they older? What kinds of details of their life can you sort of align with and help them sort of go to where they need to get or get them to where they need to get? while sort of, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of pandering to their style, I mm -hmm. guess, for lack of a better term. And, um, you know, it's it's really, really interesting to think about because it starts making you take on a role that you want. It's not just somebody who just you're giving them sets and reps of exercises to do and that's it. And if you're not following along, then that's all. You know, there's a lot more to it than that. And, you know, whether it's whether it's recognizing the fact, like what you said, that they might you might represent the only interaction of positivity or whatever mm -hmm. in their life at this time or some kind of consistency or solidarity, whatever it is, uh, you might be that for them. And, you know, I personally know people who they have clients where it's exactly that. They're not training with that. They're not training with that trainer just for the training. They're training with that trainer because they represent something so much more for them. And it's so important for them, even if they might not be the greatest client or even if they might not have the best interaction or whatever, it's something that it's a lot bigger than just working out for them. And, you know, we have to recognize that we, without being therapists or being something that's outside of our realm, we have a lot greater of an impact on a lot of people than we might even think. And uh, those people might not communicate it to us at all, but it, it's worth realizing that this is this is a bigger thing than that. And how much fitness and health, uh, fitness and training and nutrition affects mental health. It's a it's a big, big um, piece of the pie. And, you know, sometimes it's behavioral that we don't even it never gets identified, but it's you can see it right in front of you type of thing. Right. Um, I made a I made a post on Instagram. Um, maybe it was a few weeks ago now. And I was talking about something that's very interesting in terms of how training seems to affect, from what I've seen anyway, what, how mental health seems to affect people's relationships with training. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, when they're in a bad place, mentally speaking, when they're challenged with their mental health, that's when they will avoid training altogether, right? And so they're not motivated to train, they don't want to work out, and everything's just terrible. And then on the other hand, there are some people who, when they're going through stuff, they use training to actually sort of help them sort of stay like this. And so all of a sudden, it's the remedy for mental health issues or challenges with people's mental health in other per trains of mind. And then if people are going, if the person who's down here goes up here on their own, then all of a sudden they're back to training, right? Whereas the person who's using the train up here and then they fall off or something, and that's what makes them fall off. So it's just interesting how it can affect people in different ways. And so the role of a trainer or of a coach can be kind of like multidimensional in that regard. And it can be very important, very pivotal to sort of, I guess, um, put the hammer down on that consistency and understanding for the person that this is something that should never go away. You know, fitness is something that should always remain a part of your routine, something you should value and treasure. And I'm here to help you navigate that path. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think of it as pushing people back towards that middle, just consistency day in, day out, getting it done. Because <clears throat> I've had clients the same way. I know after working with them for a period of time, if they get super stressed, they just ghost you, they just disappear. I know they're not doing anything. And I, I get it. So my goal with them is exactly what you said. Okay, can we get you to go for a walk? Can we get you to do, you've got a rower in your garage. Can you just do two minutes in the morning? Can I get you just a little bit back closer on track? And then I've also got other clients who they get super stressed. It's like, I'm headed to the CrossFit gym and I'm doing the nastiest Metcon I can find. Woohoo! You know, <laughs> and I've watched their HRV just, you know, plummet the next day and they're destroyed for two days. And in the past, that used to just cause me to pull my hair out and gray hairs and drive me insane. And now I've kind of realized, to your point, that that's what they. This has nothing to do with their their physical. They needed to do that to manage their mental state. Mm. If that's what they needed to do at this point to manage their mental state, within reason, as long as they don't get hurt, I'm probably going to let them do that. But I'm also going to try to educate them and show them, okay. 
yeah, you did this, that's fine, but now you can't train for two or three days because you're so wrecked from it or you've got some other weirdness going on. Can we modify that a little bit so maybe you do a harder session, but maybe not quite so hard, right? Can I kind of get you back to that middle a little bit? And then long-term, I'm thinking, can I get you to do something to handle stress that involves either movement or also no movement? So to me, those are like the two ends of the spectrum. Like, yeah, mm. a lot of movement to modify it, but maybe for that person over time, can I get you to just chill out and meditate and do some breath work for five minutes, right? That's like the opposite polar end because when we talked about going on originally, like how do you set up clients for long-term success? To me, like the more strategies you have to deal with that, I think you're going to be better off. And then hopefully based on how you feel, where you're at physically, you're like, well, maybe I'm only going to do a you know 10-minute Metcon today and I'm going to do 10 minutes of breath work instead, right? Can we try to teach them the skills to kind of self-moderate over time? Yeah. Um, you know, what you're saying sort of lends to the idea of like a part of the fitness culture that I honestly, it, it starts, the older I get, the more it grinds my gears. And that is <laughs> the fact that, the, it's the fact that the hard core or die type of mentality. Yes. You know, yes. fitness industry as a whole is a young industry. The average age of a fitness professional, I could only imagine what it is, at least in, in Toronto. It's probably like 26 or something mm. like that. It's probably really young. And so when we start applying the mentality of fitness from that age vantage point, you know, where, okay, we're 24. We like to train hard. We train heavy. We don't get injured. We don't get hurt. Nothing is wrong. And we can look at weights and grow and we can look at weights and get stronger, or we can eat whatever we want and get away with that. We don't own any condo or house or anything like that. We don't have a wife and kids. We don't have all those responsibilities. So our stress levels are pretty good, you know, and everything is just kosher in that regard. When, we start applying that thinking or that invincible kind of nature to our clients and thinking that they should be training hard or go, going home or thinking that training for life is all about never stopping trying to get stronger and stronger and stronger and things like this. Um, it's just, it's a way to get hurt in a hurry and it's mm -hmm. a way to have a bad mental attitude towards fitness and health because you start attaching yourself to your PRs, for example, yep. and other really, really bad things like that. And, um, you know, bringing it back to the mental health aspect of things, we know how important that all is. So if you're going to try to start, it's important to get this under your belt and be like that in certain points and phases and so on and train hard. That's important because you got to get results in some way. But at the same time, if you don't realize that there's going to be a point where you have to really, really change those values and go like this with the heavy and hard stuff versus the long term longevity, training intuitively, scaling things back, recognizing that other factors like, you know, sleep, like rest, recovery, um, nutrition and all those other things, um, you know, breathing work, meditation, self-care, even like seeing a, re a res registered massage therapist, chiropractic treatment for tune ups, all that sort of thing. Um, they're going to get more and more important. Um, how important is cardio training to you? How important is mobility and flexibility work to, to you? Um, would you ever get out for a yoga or Pilates session as somebody who's carrying a ton of muscle on you? You know, like what, what do those kinds of things or pursuits of fitness represent to you, the lifter, to you, the trainer? And I would have never dreamed of saying that I want to try Pilates out when I was 24. <laughs> Now at 33, I want to try Pilates out. You know? <laughs> so these are those this is kind of like the sort of change in mindset that I think is very important. And, um, you know, the more we could instill that in our clients, it comes with I have to say that this sort of thing does come with age a little bit as well. You know, it's not incidental to a young, fresh, youthful trainer and so on. You got to be in the game for a little while training and, and working with clients and so on for a long time, because then you'll realize that, like, the way that you'll approach a 23 year old who wants to get big and strong is not the same way that you're going to approach a 53 year old who wants to get big and strong. Same goals, probably going to take a different approach to training and nutrition and everything else. And, um, you know, it's a realization that can be very humbling and something that can be sobering a little bit for a, a trainer who thinks that there's sort of a one size fits all approach to everything. And uh, it would really, really change the landscape of the industry and its culture if uh, there were more people to recognize this. Yeah, no, I'm preaching to the choir. I 
I agree hundred percent. I even switched all my <clears throat> assessments about two and a half years ago now to include at least some factor in each one of those, some mobility assessments, some movement assessment, obviously their goals, a full cardiovascular profile, breath work, CO2 tolerance, all this stuff that takes about a week for them to do. And even if like pretty much everyone goes through the same assessment, it's changed a little bit depending upon their goals, but there's always some component of each one in there. And even if someone comes in and goes, ah, bro, I just want to get like as big and strong as possible, I'm still going to have them do a cardiovascular assessment, right? Because I know that may not necessarily be their goal, but I know that once those things get to a threshold where they can no longer do certain things, like if you need four plates on a squat per side just to hit depth, that may be okay for powerlifting, but that scares the shit out of me for you walking around day to day. That tells Mm -hmm. me that there's probably not something right there. So if your goal is just to get bigger and stronger, I also think as trainers, part of our goal is to have some sort of assessment or at least education to bring up these other things before they actually become issues, right? We don't want your cardiovascular fitness to degrade to be so low that you get winded walking up a flight of stairs. You know, there's probably some threshold you need to keep as just a normal functioning human being. And I feel like part of the job as a trainer is to keep an eye on those things. And even like pain is a big one too. You know, like I, I just don't like being any pain from lifting now. I just have such a very excruciatingly low tolerance for it where eh, 15 years ago, even maybe I'd be like, eh, that's just part of it. That's just the way it is. Cause everybody I knew at that time always had pain. So that was like my normal. And then I remember getting just so destroyed once uh, I went to a seminar I remember laying in an Epsom salt bath going, what am I doing to myself? Like I am destroying myself by my own free will for, (laughs) you know, numbers that like high school chicks were doing. You know what I mean? (laughs) It wasn't like I was going to be a professional at powerlifting, you know, at all. I remember asking one of the, the coaches I worked with at the time who was very, very observant, but never really said anything out loud. And I told him what I was thinking. I said, well, you know, what should I do? He's like, fire your current coach and do like everything about 180 degrees the opposite of what you're doing now. And I'm like, yeah, that's solid advice. (laughs) 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 You know, uh, to what you said there, um, it just made me think about the fact that like there is a trade-off with every goal that you pursue in fitness whether it's to get very strong if you want to get very strong you could probably get it you could probably expect your conditioning to start to go down you could probably expect your body composition to change in terms of body fat percentage and stuff like that to achieve really great results in terms of strength stuff like that's going to happen to achieve great results in terms of size you're probably going to lose flexibility and mobility you know to achieve great results in um, cardiorespiratory capacity you might lose some muscle mass, you might lose some some strength and so on, you know, like everything comes with a little bit of a trade off. So right now, especially in the strength and conditioning world, a lot of the emphasis is usually placed toward the strength side of strength and conditioning. That's just how the nature of it is. And so with that said, and with that in mind, um, how strong do we need to get? How strong is strong enough? And why aren't more people talking about this, right? Um, It's not to say that we should all be, okay, well, I can bench press one plate, so I'm good for life. No, it's not that. (laughs) But it does mean mean that uh, we have to realize that there's going to be a certain point where there's going to be uh, the risk reward is going to sort of change in its values, especially as time goes on. Um, not only as time goes on calendar age wise, but as time goes on, as far as what PRs you achieve. So I might have less collateral damage when I can bench press 135 and then a little less collateral damage when I do 225. But when I start getting to 365 and 400 pounds and so on, like there's probably an injury I had to sustain along the way to get there. There's probably less mobility and a lot more muscle on my body as well to start subtracting from those other goals I was talking about, the trade-offs and so on. There are just factors that now start influencing what your capability is in these lifts. You've also also probably spent a whole lot of time bench pressing to get that 405 Mm -hmm. bench press. So what other exercises could you have done during that period of time that could have been more healthy for your shoulder? or more uh, better for your conditioning, or whatever have you. So my point being that 
when it comes to strength gains and trying to push PRs all the time and so on, we have to realize that beyond a certain point, that still makes you a healthy, functional, um, well-rounded individual from an athletic perspective. Uh, beyond a certain point, now we're starting to get into a hobby. We're not getting into things that are mandatory that we need to look into. And me trying to improve on my 515 deadlift, it's not needed. <laughs> Whereas somebody who might have you know, back pain from just bending over to pick up the empty bar. Okay, well, they need to deadlift and they need to get strong in the deadlift, you know? So it's just, we have to recognize when we sort of set the limitation and say, okay, you know what? I'm going to step back away from this kind of goal and start pursuing these kind of goals instead. And um, it, it can mean a world of difference for the experience of chronic pain that you deal with, uh, a world of difference for your mental calm and your mental health, because you're not going to think about, oh, well, I only deadlifted 475 today instead of 505. So I'm off my game and that's going to I'm going to take that <laughs> home with me. Right. And so like that kind of culture is the sort of thing that needs to die if we really want to think about. Um, you know, being able to have an impressive workout or have an impressive uh, physique or, or have an impressive performance when we are 70 and 80 and 85 years old, you know, and uh, if you ask anybody who is that kind of age, who does have impressive stuff behind their belt, and who does have a great physique and who does have great look and movement patterns and all that stuff, you ask them, so like, what have you done the last 40 years? They're not going to say, oh, you know, I pushed my PR in the bench press. I pushed my PR <laughs> in the squat deadlift. They're not going to say that, right? They're going to say, oh, yeah, you know what? I do a lot more cardio. I focus on stretching and mobility work a lot. They say these types of things. They're going to say, I focus on, um, you know, proper movement. I don't train too heavy anymore. Um, I train for repetitions a lot more often these days. Um, th these are the kind I do. I do a yoga session every week. I'm in Pilates or whatever. You know, they're going to talk about a lot more of diversified approach to their training that probably doesn't involve going hard as you can against uh, balls to the wall every single workout. That's that's definitely not the way to get sustainable results. Yeah. And a lot of it, people think that it just the human brain wants to think everything is just nice, neat and linear. And most things are not linear at all. And I think that curve is an exponential curve where you start pushing lifts to whatever your capacity is. And you're trying to gain, you know, another 15 pounds, say on your deadlift. Yeah, definitely possible. You can definitely do it. But you're getting to that point of the curve where the risk reward starts getting steep. You know, mm -hmm. for a small gain overall compared to the standard poundage you're moving, the risk starts getting exponentially higher. You know, and I think it's where are those points and to me as a client educated ab about that. And if they're like, you know, my goal is to hit, you know, 545. I know I'm taking a little bit more risk. This has been my lifelong goal. It's what I want to do. Okay, cool. There's things we'll do to try to, to mitigate the risk and if you're okay with it, then that's cool, man. I'm okay with it. But I want to make sure that I'm educating them to understand the process and so that they can make a real informed decision. And that even gets back to, like, what are their overall goals? Like, I've gotten the habit now of asking clients, like, what's just your lifelong goal? Like, what's 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? Like, as you're training, you're lifting, whatever you're doing, does this fit into your life now? And do you expect it to fit into your life in the future? Right. Like for myself, probably as of five years ago, I had to kind of step back and go, okay, well, what is it that I really want to do? Like, what is like my number one, just general movement goal? And even now it's still kiteboarding. You know, if I could go kiteboard every day instead of lift, I would, I would do that. Obviously I'd probably do both. Um, but then you go, okay, well, what is the risk of that? Like, so my goal for this year is trying to, you know, jump 20 feet in the air uh, vertical, which I've done a few times, but try to do that, you know, whenever I'm able to. The chance are that if I screw it up, I'm going to get dropped out of the sky 20 feet under the water like a sack of potatoes. That's a pretty high risk, but I'm okay with that because that's my goal. I understand the risk. I know what's involved in it. Yeah, there's ways you can do it safely and progress and things like that. But to me, that's a higher goal than... Yeah, pushing my bench press and my right shoulder hurts a little bit. Nah, bro, I'm just going to push harder. You know, where some people from the outside looking in would be like, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Like, why are you taking this massive risk over here, but you're not taking a smaller risk? And that goes back to what are your goals and what are your tolerances? Like, if I get injured kiteboarding as much as I don't want that to happen, I'm trying to do everything I can to mitigate it. I'm okay with it because I know I'm at the point where I'm pushing the risk higher. 
to me, if I get injured in the gym, that's me being stupid because it's a hundred percent completely controlled environment. It usually means right. my ego got ahead of me and something bad happened. Like to me, all those things can be controlled. And I know that freak injuries happen, but it should be relatively rare. So I think also having those discussions with your clients of, you know, Hey, this thing you're doing in the gym, does this fit into your lifestyle now? What are your goals in the future? And is everything, you know, lining up? If not, can we get like some rough time frame of, you know, okay, you've got one year to hit what 550 on the deadlift. And after that, we'll reassess to see if it's worth the risk or not. Or you're waking up in the morning, your pain on a scale of one to 10 is like now starting to hit a four or five. Is this something you still want to, you know, progress? And to me, like, I mean, I never had any of these conversations with clients even five, eight years ago. I was like, ah, just train, just do more sets and reps. My goal is to get you to your goal and we're all good. So right. I think that's also the next kind of level of making sure you're, you're kind of, I don't want to say protecting them from themselves, but you're el- educating them about stuff along the way they may not see. Yeah. Um, you know, taking on uh, uh, that mindset of, um, you know, just changing your approach to uh, it's not all about grinding out these reps. It's not all about getting to a certain PR just because. And it's not all about, uh, you know, elevating the amount of risk that's associated with it by the things that you're attempting on the regular and disregarding your your levels of uh, health while you do it. I, I think that um, one thing that's kind of uh, I sort of like to try to strategically put into my uh, programs a lot with my clients, especially online clients who I can't see in person Um is things that are not quantifiable, right? So I will give them exercises that involve, they they can't track it in a way. They Mm -hmm. can't really measure just how well they've done. You know, they might be body weight oriented. So it's like, you can't say how much weight you're lifting or or they might be isometrics as well, where you get to use 100% of your max effort all the time every single time you try it, Mm -hmm. you know, and so you're getting destroyed by this sort of thing. And the risk factor is way down because there's no movement in the skeleton. And, um, you know, you just you get the greatest uh, benefit from it from a neurological perspective, you get a greatest benefit from a muscular contractive perspective, all that stuff. So it's great. It's covered. And um, using different approaches like that and tactics like that, um, A, it usually can be kind of humbling for the person, too, because they're like, oh, well, you know, I bench 300. How come I can't do this isometric chest chest press or whatever? Mm-hmm. Or, or um, you know, or, hey, I can do a 500-pound deadlift. How come this Chinese plank with 30-pound dumbbell is killing my mm-hmm. posterior chain right now? You know, so just doing things where it forces you a little bit to realize that there are weak links there and these weak links will definitely contribute to your overall goal of getting the heavier deadlift or whatnot but uh on top of it practicing them on their own as their own workout is going to be as beneficial or more beneficial to you because it's something that you're not good at it's something that's going to challenge you in a different plane of motion or a different sort of uh curve of force or whatever have you and these are the kinds of things that are going to uh, really make you more athletic and really exploit the areas that you have been neglecting for such a long period of time and um, it might even just naturally turn people's minds away from that sort of like one track minded sort of state of being where it's I got to get stronger I got to get stronger in these particular five lifts and that's it you know and then when you don't compete in anything that involves those lifts you got to ask yourself after a while, like, what am I, what am I really trying to do here? You know, do I need to keep on pushing, pushing the pedal to the metal with these movements or what? Yeah. Yeah. And similar to that, I like, um, exercises and some of those are this too, where they're almost self-limiting. Like I could tell you to do this exercise and I know that you probably have to execute it at least relatively well, or you can't do it. Right. So for some clients, I don't trust a lot of overhead pressing. I'm like, okay, sit flat on your butt on the floor, your legs out about 45 degrees. You're going to use a dumbbell or kettlebell and you're only going to press with your one arm at a time. Yeah. And they're like, what? This is weird. But what they figure out real fast is I can't hyperextend too far back because I'm going to fall over. I can't really move anywhere else. Um, And it's more almost a contralateral stabilization than it really is an overhead press. Right. So if they can't stabilize on the opposite side, they are they just can't do it. Um, right. Same thing with like grip stuff. Like in the past when I was doing more stuff here at the gym, you would have some, you know, usually younger males that would come in. And like, bro, you got to see my deadlift. It's amazing. 
and it looks like a pooping dog. And you're just like, you're doing like the face palm thing where you're like, oh my God, that's so horrible. Please don't injure yourself here. You know, so I'm like, okay. So you, next time you come over, all your deadlifts for the next foreseeable future are double overhand on a two inch axle that doesn't rotate. Right. And it's the weirdest sensation to do something you could do before with a mixed grip or kind of crazy form to have your grip now be the main limiter. So you, yeah. you've cut their top end on purpose because most people their grip's going to be you know the weak link and it's a uh, it's a weird thing but the nice part is that it's almost uh an auto limiting exercise too especially like you know, i train most of my clients now online um so but you're still having them do something and you don't <laughs> feel as worried about that kind of that risk reward ratio we're talking about too yeah you know like just different things to sort of again like sort of limit their 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 ceiling there yeah. or their feeling of, of capacity or capability uh so that now they are placed in a in a disadvantaged position and they have to overcome that in order to perform yes. the lift and do well in the lift right and um you know people don't realize like okay let's talk about a 405 pound deadlift there's a lot of people out there who train who can pick up 405 pounds and stand up with it. It's a lot of weight, but there's a lot of people who can do it. But the amount of people who can do that with a good, proper posture throughout the entire force curve and make it look like they're actually recruiting the right muscles to do it and so on. Well, now we got to take that that percentage and <laughs> it's a fraction of the percentage. Right? Yeah. So people don't realize just what kind of skill and what kind of level of training proficiency you need to acquire to really make a relatively decent to heavy weight look good and appear proper, right? Um, there's a lot of moving parts to this as well, but um, that's that's the base statement that I'm going to make there. And then when you start seeing people train with a mixed grip, for example, or do things with different stances or whatnot, people will say, oh, well, you know what? Uh, Eddie Hall lifts with a mixed grip, so that means that it's the right way to go. Well, it's <laughs> like, well, Eddie Hall had probably has done double overhand for so long right. before he switched. You know what I mean? And when he's trying those 900-pound pulls, then he mixes it up. And he doesn't do that for the other sets and whatever, right? So my point being that, like, sometimes people don't have the whole story and they apply what the best people in the industry or in the, in the uh, arena that we're talking about, they apply what they're doing to them when they don't need to be, when they shouldn't be. And they have to look at things sort of more on an individual level. Talking about... Um, uh, what uh, things could humble a client or what things could make a client sort of realize that they have um, other areas that they can look at for a new ceiling, mm. right? Um, what you were talking about with the axle bar, for example, right? The no rotation, the grip strength being the stronger, the, the biggest limiting factor and so on. So it's sort of like what I, one thing that I like to do, which is, okay, so you squat X amount of weight, so you deadlift X amount of weight, uh, so you bench press X amount of weight. Okay, well, let's change your tempo up. Simple mm -hmm. change, right? You're not going to rush through your negative rep. You're going to go into your negative rep with a four-second eccentric, and you're going to be strict with that. Then at the bottom of the repetition, you're going to pause there for a two second count and you're going to hold that. Then you're going to come up to the top. All of a sudden, when you used to be able to lift 405 pounds, well, now you could only do 310 pounds be with the same amount of reps because of how you've changed your tempo. And the profile of that resistance is a little bit different as well. Like it's just a world of difference. And all of a sudden you have the same training effect without your joints being exposed to the same amount of absolute weight. And um, that could be a really good thing for people, especially if they're not, again, 20 or 21 years old. But even if they are, too, you know, and um, you know, that's a, that's a great sort of tactic that I like to use and just just monitoring and modifying tempo and the way that reps and sets are being performed. And, um, you know, the more things that you can sort of incorporate into a program that sort of exploits that because most people ignore it, um, the better it is for everybody, for you as a, as a trainer who might be liable, uh, for a, a client who might be, uh, you know, in need of a, a plateau to be broken or for uh, further results results or for uh, re regarding their age and their, their, their previous injuries and whatever, um, all these kinds of things, it can uh, really, really be affected positively by just looking at the way the reps are performed. And uh, even if you don't have all the fanciest equipment, well, all of a sudden you're doing bicep curls. Well, guess what? You're going to slow them down. That's all you're going to do. Same weights, right? And it changes the game a whole lot. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of that. Um, I've done a lot of uh, triphasic training from obviously from Cal Dietz of Okay, I use it a lot in online clients, especially on their squat, because 
if you move fast, you can basically kind of hide flaws, right? You won't feel them as much. And I don't necessarily want people incredibly in their body when they're when they're doing the actual execution of a rep, especially a heavier load. Um, so just saying, okay, like you said, four second to five second eccentric. And if I don't trust them, like send me a video. Because I know if I say five seconds, it's going to be about two seconds. <laughs> um, so send me a video. And even then, like the amount of improvement in their form is pretty drastic. Like you said, just by changing the tempo. Yeah. You know? And that's, I think, something that we tend to forget. And then, okay, especially if you're bouncing a lot out of the bottom. Okay, now you're going to go down. You're going to pause at the bottom for four to five seconds. You're not going to rest on your joints. You're going to come up about an inch just from where you'll be hanging out on all your soft tissue, and you have to hold that and then now come back up. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think stuff like that is super useful and underutilized, especially when clients are trying to fix some form stuff or they're trying to learn newer lifts too. Yeah. Um, you know, and like you said, uh, the sending of videos for online clients, big time, you know, uh, it's, I, I was feeling a little bit embarrassed because when you were telling me your, your intake process with, with with new clients, it's like, it's <laughs> so much more exhaustive and elaborate than mine. All I do is I'll get someone to fill out a questionnaire for me that details their life and their training habits and all that stuff. And then, uh, I'll ask them for videos of their major lifts. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the clients who come my way, they already have a lifting background. Hence they're looking for online coaching. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like I'll say, okay, I want to see your ba big movements, your major lifts. I don't need to see your maxes. I just want to see, give me 10 reps of, of a squat. Give me 10 of a dead. Give me 10 of an overhead press. If you knew chin ups, give me a few chin ups. Uh, give me any row pattern. I want to see how your body is moving and what kind of technique that you have. And then I'll get back to them with all of my feedback, uh, a detailed level of what kinds of things that I'm seeing and what recommendations that I might have from it. So that's usually the way that I, it goes when it comes to uh, my intake process. And um, it really, really can start helping me clear things up in terms of what technical modifications or how which direction I'm going to go with programming for them since I make it custom for everybody, right? And, um, you know, that sort of uh, approach to things or, or just being thorough enough like that, it's going to be super important because, like, if you have somebody who thinks that they're doing really, really great stuff or they have the perfect form and so on, then you find out that their depth is poor or their mobility is really lacking in this particular area or, or whatever, they might not have even ever taken a video of themselves lifting. And the first yeah. time they've done this is for you for this intake process. And then it exposes a whole bunch of stuff they didn't know they were doing poorly. Right. So, um, yeah, you know, it just it's it's a game changer. And I think that filming and recording your own sets, even if it isn't for somebody just for yourself, it's going to be super important because, you know, there have been a lot of times where someone says, hey, Lee, I read your article on uh, T Nation or whatever, and uh, I want to get in touch with you for an in-person session so that you can give me a workout or whatever. I said, OK, sure. This is where I'm training clients, blah, blah. Right. And so then they meet me for the first time and they tell me all the stuff. They read all this stuff. They have all this knowledge and so on. And they do. But then because of the fact that no one's ever watched them train before, yes. they don't realize just how poor technically they are. So they can't really connect those dots. Right. And so they have all the knowledge and they know that they should be doing this. And they talk about triphasic method and they talk about all kinds of training programs and elaborate stuff, wave loading and German volume training, and <laughs> ratchet loading and so on. And they do all this stuff, but I watch them lift and it's like, you shouldn't be doing much of this stuff yet because you don't have the foundation, right? And no one's told you you don't have the foundation and you've never watched yourself. So you see videos of Christian Thibodeau doing a, a bench press with perfect form or a video of Mike Nelson doing a deadlift with great form or me doing a overhead press with good form. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. And, right. <laughs> and, and uh, it's like, okay, so I know what to do. So I'm going to try to do it the same way but I don't watch myself. I only watch them. So I feel like them, but I don't look like them in real life. Right. And so I think that, um, that, that factor, the factor of not being able to sort of see what you're doing, it's a big, big change. It's a game changer for a lot of people. So, I mean, videoing your sets, this is sort of my recommendation to everybody who's sort of watching and listening right now is like videotape and record your sets and take, you don't have to do it every single time, but take note of what you look like when you're lifting, because it's the next best thing for, uh, to not having a trainer there is having that visual cue. So you know what you're actually looking like and you can sort of self correct as you go along, hopefully. So it can really help you out. Um, it's, it's invaluable to be able to see yourself and a mirror isn't the same thing. It's no. not the same thing as using a mirror while you're doing it. No. And even with, uh, 
uh, my advanced clients, I'll sometimes, depending on where they're at, they'll do a video and I'll write back, what do you see? Right. Because I want them. And especially I do this a lot with uh, newer trainers too. And it's crazy. I remember like I used to teach at uh, Globe University for a while. We had a full program for two to four years that only taught personal trainers. Fortunately, they went out of business. I know you teach a lot of personal trainers in academia now too. Yeah. And you forget sometimes that what you see is not what everyone else sees. So I used to do this drill where I would show a picture of a squat and I'd show it to the class. And I'm like, all right, what do you guys see? And they'd all kind of first, you know, stare at each other. <laughs> and then to, to me, it's obvious after having done it for just thousands and thousands of reps, but it was very helpful when someone did this to me when I was learning, because you forget that, yes, you're seeing it, but if you have nothing in your brain that makes any sense of it, you actually don't see it, unquote. So right. it would take a while and they're like, I don't see anything, looks good. I'm like, okay, look at their knees, right? So you're trying to get them closer. Oh, okay. Oh, the right knee's coming in a little bit. Okay, right? Now we can discuss later if that's good, bad, indifferent, whatever. Right. But my first step was, you all saw the exact same video. Like that image came and registered in your brain, but you don't have the experience and the reps to know what to look for or what to do with that information also. So trying right. to do that process, I think with clients has been super helpful. Um, a good buddy of mine here, Sean Mishka, a tip I got from him was he would video clients or watch them. And then he would ask them, he goes, well, how does it feel? And he's like, the mistake I made, and I did this wrong for years, is the second they rack the weight, I would have them watch a video or I'd ask them, how did it feel? And almost invariably, the response would be, oh, good. And he's like, you need to give them like five, maybe even 10 seconds to stop think about what actually happened during the lift and then actually give you an honest answer because people yep. want to please you and give you the answer that they expect subconsciously yep. they're supposed to give. So he's like, allow them some time just to process and think back um, on it. So if you're doing yep. it with video, what I've done too is I'll take the video and before I look at it, I'll write down, okay, here's what I think happened. And so for like, I did this last year with front squats and I'm like, man, Felt really slow at the top. I write that down. Look at the video. Oh, actually, it wasn't that slow at the top. <laughs> you know, so sometimes what you feel or what you think you feel isn't necessarily there. Where in yeah. the past, I would look at the video right away and I want internally try to think about what was actually going on, right? Because I want my internal map to match the actual external map and those to be, you know, congruent, which is kind of a skill set. Big time, uh, big time, you know, and again, it does come down again to like just being able to see what you're doing and, yeah. <laughs> you know, having that delay. Sometimes if I'm training myself and I'm uh, filming myself as well, uh, many times it's due to negligence, but I'll, uh, I'll <laughs> record the set and then um, I'll turn off my camera and then I'll go into my next thing. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I never even watched that squad video that I yeah. took like seven, <laughs> eight, eight sets ago or something. And then I'll look again and I'll be like, oh, okay, well, you know, and it gives you that feedback regardless, whether it's something that you want to want to see or something you don't want to see uh, where it's like, oh, well, my, my heels came up a little bit there or my, my knees wobbled here and there or whatever it is, or my hips shot up early in this set in this repetition, you know, um, it's it's really really good and you know everyone's got a smartphone now everyone's got a yeah. phone with a camera on it people will say oh i don't know where to put it or i don't want to ask somebody please yeah. pop it up somewhere use another dumbbell whatever it is or if i got a tripod that i'm using to do this call right now <laughs> you know like you know just these these kinds of little gadgets and little things they're everywhere just grab one the same way you'd go and grab a pair of straps or an or a, a, a iron water bottle or whatever Grab your tripod and grab your little hardware for you to film your things and record your sets. It's not going to get in anyone's way and you just do your thing. And that way you have that feedback. It's amazing how much of a changer it can be to understanding where you're screwing up, what your form really looks like and how to improve on it. Um, and, you know, form matters above everything, if you ask me. And um, it, it's especially, again, as time goes on, it's less about, you know, moving loads and it's more about loading movements. And so you want to do that the right way. Last question as we wrap up. Um, related to this, do you think, because now there's this massive rush to everyone wants to be an online trainer, quote unquote. And just, I think we saw from COVID like a influx of, I would say, very crappy online 
training material from questionable resources. But mm. um, do you think people should have some experience of in-person training before they move into online training, especially in regards to exercise? I can see nutrition is going to be a little bit um, different, but especially considering what we talked about with, you know, form and cues and movement and everything else. Yeah, I believe so. I think that it's a, I think it's important. I don't think I'll ever pivot from that stance, regardless of how severe COVID closures and uh, gym uh, employment becomes or whatever in terms of the difficulty. Um, I still think that it's really, really invaluable and the most quintessential piece of the pie to have that in person one on one training background sort of uh, there. Um, it it's better because, you know, Here's one thing, you know, someone submits a video to you online and you and I, we can do it where we can watch what's happening, but they have it from one fixed angle. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they're taking that video from a three quarter angle behind them doing the squat. Yeah. And so it's on. always at an off angle, too. Right. It's never 90, right. 90. It's like 46 degrees behind at an angle behind <laughs> a squat rack pavilion or something. <laughs> exactly. Right. And so it's like we're good enough to be able to really say, okay, I can see this, this, and this, and I can even assume that this, right. this, and this happened too, right? Um, you know, a lot of times people will submit me their deadlift video from a complete front view, and I'm sort of just like, <laughs> okay, so I can tell that your knees are staying straight, but yeah. at the same time, like, what is going on with your spine behind? I right. can't see any of that. I could only assume things, right? So, you know, whereas when you're in person, like, there's no trainer who's worth their salt who's going to say that they stand in one place while they watch the client do yeah. all their exercises like period they're going to be moving around a little bit and um and that 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 in itself shows just how much more important um that sort of thing is and the feedback that you asked for yourself as well you know how did that feel after the set uh what did you notice what do you see when you do this these kinds of things that feedback and that communication and that response um being able to sort of have that interaction with a client is going to be worth its weight in gold. Um, and there's always going to be those things that you can't sort of predict. For example, I remember having one client uh, when I was 20, when I was a first year trainer, and she was a total beginner in working out. And I was getting increasingly frustrated with all the things that I was trying to make her do that just wouldn't land well. None of them would land well. She wouldn't feel the spots. And I think it reached its sort of, it's, we reached the peak for me when I said, okay, you know what? I'm just going to get you doing hamstring curls, prone hamstring curls on the machine, just like this. You're going to do it, set you up, your knees in line with the axis of the machine. You got your heels in the right spot. You got the pad on the, on the, just above the heels. Everything is set. You're going to hold on tight, squeeze your butt and you're going to curl. So she does it and she does a great looking set. I said, so where did you feel that? Right. And she told me her quadriceps. And I was like, <laughs> are you sure? You know, so I asked her like three times and then she pointed to her quadriceps saying this is what's burning. And so it's like I had zero answer for this. I had mm -hmm. no idea what I was doing. And uh, that just goes to show that there's always going to be those freak cases out there where something doesn't register or the li the wires are crossed a little bit as somebody gets a certain training effect from a certain exercise that's not intended for that training effect and so on. This is sort of the mystery of the human body that we have to account for is that all of our research and all of our things that we say and all the claims that we make, they're still based on some kind of inference. They're still based on some kind of guesswork, educated guesswork and things that research might suggest and support, but nothing is for sure, right? That's why one person might get bigger calves from doing bicep curl standing, whereas another person won't get bigger calves from bicep curl standing, right? This is the, the variability of this sort of industry and what it is. It's, it's the human biology. It's different. Um, and so with all of that being said, being exposed to those kinds of intangibles in person with a client are just like they're so important to have that sort of under your belt and it just makes it a lot easier for you to make the transition to online and work with clients online um, where you can't see them, where you can't have those conversations on the fly. Um, you know, it's it's very, very different when you're just prescribing exercises and you want them to just do them right. Um, and you could only intake so much and even getting videos back. It's still only the next best thing compared to the yeah. real deal. And uh, you can usually always tell when somebody has that foundation of working with clients in person compared to just working online with clients. It's, it's, it's usually pretty obvious. So 
that's that's my answer to that. I believe that they must have a background in that sort of thing in order to really, really be uh, legit. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, 14 years ago, I started, I thought, oh, I'm going to be an online trainer because I'd worked with an online trainer then. And I just didn't have that much in-person experience at the point. I had only done yeah, maybe a couple of years. And I remember doing it for about a year. And at this point, like getting videos was super hard. You had the old school, like flip phones had just come out where that was like the brand new thing. And videos were just grainy and took forever to upload. And it was a disaster. I feel so <laughs> bad for like any people I trained back then because like you said, I had no idea how bad people could screw stuff up because I didn't have any in-person movement to know that oh, wow, you could screw up a squat like that. Even though I said squat to a chair, body weight yes. only, yep. wow, you can really, <laughs> you could get some crazy shit going on that you just, you don't know what you don't know at that point. So right. luckily I had enough intuition to stop because it was a disaster. And I said, okay, I'm not doing this again until I have a way of evaluating everything. And I have a lot more experience in person, you know, looking at different angles. You know, I worked with a lot of general population clients at the time just trying to figure out, in essence, all the different ways they can screw up a movement. So when someone says, oh, this doesn't feel good, I kind of feel it here, you flash back to those clients, like literally in your head of like, oh yeah, this guy or this guy or this guy, oh, okay, we did this or this or this. So you have like some yep. options to pick from and you have some kind of relevant experience you can draw from too, which I think is invaluable. Big time. And uh, of course, it goes without saying that being on top of training for yourself is going to be I tell all my college oh, yeah. students, as well, like you got to You got to make sure like who in this room first cl first class of the year of the semester every single time who in this room trains in the gym regularly, you know, and everybody's hand should be up right now type yeah. of thing, you know. If it's not, that is like homework lesson number one. Like you got to get in and do this stuff so you understand that what you're prescribing and how it should feel, right? Um, and, and what kind of responses it might give you. Because somebody might not think that, um, you know, a great movement like a, a Nordic curl or a glute hamstring raise could cause like PCL stress on the, on the posterior cruciate ligament, that type of thing. And that the only way that I started talking or writing about that sort of thing was from my own personal experience from realizing. And then I had a client, client, client who said the same thing over the years, you know? Yeah. The back of my knee kind of hurts when I do mm -hmm. that. I don't know it bothers me. I feel my hamstrings, but my knee Right. And then it's like, oh, well, I thought this was this bulletproof exercise, but it's clear that it I'm not the only person that it affects this way. So, you know, just little things like that, where you realize through anecdote and through that personal experience and through being in the trenches and training yourself and so on, like how how things can affect the body and so on. Right. I write and talk a lot about tall lifters and different anthropometry and leverages and so on as well, and how certain movements and certain loading can affect that body type or different kinds of body types in different ways because there is going to be an ideal body for certain lifts and for weightlifting as a whole there's going to be an ideal body type for that just like there's an ideal body type for swimming and just like there's an ideal body type for uh sprinting and so on right so um we shouldn't sort of take that for granted especially considering that just like sprinters are trying to perform their best swimmers are trying to perform their best for a lot of people who are out there, weight training, they want to get their performance at the top too. They want to perform as best they can and reach a certain potential. And so um, we have to realize that if we're going to approach that like a sport too, then we have to realize that uh, there's going to be certain things that have to sort of give and certain things that have to be going for us body composition wise. And there are going to be limitations if we don't have that sort of proportions and those sort of anthropometry and leverages. So we got to recognize how to train around that sort of thing if it is present. Yeah, I remember I taught uh, graduate labs for exercise physiology. So 400, you know, exercise 435. And they had to come in the lab and do exercise. And we would do, you know, metabolic hearts, wing gates, we do all this stuff. So they get practice, both being a participant and actually doing it. And it was just mind blowing to me that like probably a half to maybe sometimes two thirds of the class who's in a four-year undergraduate degree for exercise phys. And granted, some of them go on to be, you know, nursing, physical therapy, that type of stuff. They're not all going to be trainers. Um, they didn't exercise. Yeah. And I'm like, but you're, you're doing a four-year degree in exercise physiology. And even my PhD advisor, he did some biking, but that was about it. I remember asking him one day, and I'm like, 
why do you not care about exercise performance? Like, to me, that is like exercise physiology. He's like, oh, he's like, I don't give a shit. He's like, I just use exercise as a stressor to just like push stuff around in the body and see what happens. Huh. I was like, this is so weird. <laughs> 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 to me, it was just like, so we always had this constant battle of, I'm trying to think of it in performance and stressors. And he's just like, nah, we just think of it as a stressor. I don't care about performance. Doesn't matter. And yeah, so it was very hmm. odd. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. You know, for me, I think that like, you know, if you can't, if you can't do it or you haven't done it, then don't coach it. Simple enough, you know, yeah. and um, that, that's uh, you try to set that foundation early with the young student or so on who's, uh, you know, trying to get the understanding of this, these concepts and of kinematics and kinesiology as a whole. Like you got to be able to understand how to move yourself and how to exercise and what loading feels like and what cardio feels like and all those things. So, um, you know, I stand behind that thinking as well. Yeah, I call it to the clients. I'm like, yep, I. If I'm forcing you to do a max 2K, then I'm going to do a max 2K, or at least I've done it relatively recent because, you know, you have to eat your own dog food also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all your time today. Where can people find more about you? I know you've got a bunch of stuff. You do online training. You do uh, fix your form. People can send in videos, get your professional opinion on them. Uh, give us the lowdown. Yeah. Um, so first of all, social media, I'm pretty active on that stuff. So uh, Coach Lee Boyce is the handle across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Coach Lee Boyce. And also um, my website is leeboyce.com. So you guys can check out archives and archives and archives of articles for different magazines and publications online and in print. And also um, my own blog blog where I talk about fitness culture and a lot of the things that we were talking about here today, that kind of subject matter enters the, the blogs a lot. And um, that's on that's on the main page of the uh, of the website. So you'll see all of that stuff there. And uh, I share all that stuff at some point on social media anyway. So, um, you know, you're pretty much covered no matter where you decide to follow. I think you have a newsletter too, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I got the newsletter as well. And uh, so you can subscribe and, uh, you know, you get the updates as well whenever I put something out. And um, yeah, it's all it's all taken care of there. And uh, if people want to hit me up for online coaching or anything like that during this time, people are building up their home gyms or their uh, their uh, garage gyms and so on because of uh, no gym openings in real life. So because of that, there's a lot of waves with the online coaching, which is one of the services that I do offer. So feel free to, to hit me up for that or even a form check like you mentioned. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much. I really appreciate it and hope to see you again in person. I think the last time we hung out was the virtual conference, oddly enough, for the NSCA because we yep. overlapped filming by like a day. So we got to have breakfast, I think, in yeah. Colorado Springs, I think. But Colorado Springs, that yeah. was back in 20, 2018, wasn't it? Yeah, was it there was yeah. no fitness summit this year, unfortunately. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, so hopefully after all this, we'll we'll be able to get together and hang out again and you can uh, give me some deadlift tips. <laughs> <laughs> of course, man. I'd love to. Cool. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Have a good lift. Thanks a lot, man. Cool. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. Huge shout out and thank you to, to Lee for doing that from his car. Uh, he was safe in a parking lot on his way to the gym today. Always enjoy talking to him. Uh, I really encourage you to check out his stuff. He's got great stuff he's been putting out for many years and just really enjoy your conversations. This is brought to you by the Flex Diet certification. Go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com for eight interventions on nutrition and recovery. Everything from protein, carbohydrates, fasting, uh, fats, uh, sleep, neat, so non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, exercise, and more. Go to flexdiet.com. Go to the wait list. That'll put you on the daily newsletter. Where you'll get all cool information, and you'll be the first to be notified of when the Flex Diet cert opens up again. Any feedback from me, please hit me up at admin at flexdiet.com, or you can find me via other channels. Leave any comments, uh, any feedback is greatly appreciated. Thank you all so much for listening. Talk to you again soon.